Hello, hello, I'm live. And uh, I'm live on YouTube, I'm live on Facebook, I'm live all over the world. Praise God. And tonight, we're going to talk about one of the champions of the faith. Again, we're continuing the series. It's the sixth one in the series, which means we've been in lockdown for six weeks. Oh, but we're soon coming out, amen. And we're coming out braver, bigger, stronger, more anointed, more learned. And we're going to have an awesome breakout. We're going to have an awesome service today as well. Like I said this morning, information is food for the soul. And the information you're going to get today is going to really help you. Praise God. And so, yeah, let me know if you're listening on. A bit early, someone just told me. 6.31, I've got on my watch. Oh, that was for the test run. Okay, awesome. Well, Facebook users watching, praise good. Morning, Terry is getting hold of this. Lee saying hello. Fortune saying hello. Laura saying woohoo. Woohoo there from Laura. Uh, just testing. That was me just testing earlier. And so, yeah, live and direct to our living room. Absolutely. Hello, Ben and all. Hello, Den and Jen. Praise God. So it's definitely working on YouTube. It's definitely working on the online one. Uh, hello. Praise God. The Carrions are in the house. Praise God. And so rather than stream to my personal page, I thought I'd try and stream it to the Tree of Life Church Encouragement Group as well. I thought that would be quite useful too. So hello to everybody and welcome. I don't know how time suddenly got ahead of me there. I was um, editing YouTube videos. I've just managed to get the worship up from last week, this morning's worship and sermon all on YouTube as well. So everything that we do here on these live streams now will be on YouTube for you to be able to watch again. And also on YouTube is our... Um, our, um, our Zoom meetings. So you can watch Tony Cook's meeting and you can watch, um, who else we had? Billy Everhart, Arthur Menchers, and so on and so forth. So that's awesome news. And so there's, uh, hold on, let me just put our YouTube channel in for you guys. And so you can then see that our YouTube channel. Okay. And it's www.tree.church slash you. YouTube. Very, very simple. There we go. So you can see that there. And you can watch all of this stuff again on YouTube. Everything we're doing live will be on YouTube. And could you do me a big favor when you watch our YouTube videos, could you please click that subscribe button? The more subscribes we get, the more functionality we have on YouTube, the more things we can actually do. So if you are watching on YouTube right now, click that subscribe button. We would really appreciate that. Like the video, but also subscribe to I Love the Tree YouTube channel. That would be absolutely awesome. So just before I get into talking about the life and times of George Jeffries, let me just give you some notices so you know what's going on this week. This week's going to be awesome. Um, so Tuesday evening, Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., Chris and Vaughn are doing their weekly live worship. That's on their Facebook page. That's on Chris and Vaughn's Facebook page, facebook.com slash Chris and Vaughn dot Lachlan. Okay, and that's going to be a really beautiful time of praise and worship. And then after that, Tuesday evening at 8 p.m., we have a Zoom meeting with Lawson Purdue. Numbers are limited, so that's Tree of Life family, really. We're bringing that into and a couple of other friends. So if you're part of the Tree of Life family and you don't have a link to that and you want to be part of that meeting with Lawson, then please email me and I will send you the link and you can be in that room and listen to Lawson preach and minister the word. That's going to be an awesome, awesome Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday, on Facebook. That's our Tree of Life Facebook page, tree.church slash Facebook or facebook.com slash I love the tree um, on Tree of Life Church um, on Wednesday night, Richard Waller. And he's doing a great series on the power of imagination. It's really beautiful. Um, next year, as we had a 2021, really that whole year, I'm going to devote to teaching about the imagination, about the power of hope. And so get your hopes up. And uh, But Richard's doing a great job for that at the moment. And then on Friday night, Lee Conwood, and he has been doing, again, an amazing job with these healing meetings. They are some of the best healing meetings I've ever been in. And uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend you telling all your sick friends to go on Facebook, our Facebook page, facebook.com slash I love the tree. You can also get there by tree.church slash Facebook. If you want to go straight to the video, go to tree.church slash Facebook Live, all one word, tree.church slash Facebook Live, all one word. So, I mean, we've got some awesome stuff going on. And if, again, anything you've missed, get the app, tree.church slash app. And on that app, you can get anything you want 
that's we've done all hundreds of hours of sermons, hundreds and hundreds of hours of sermons, and a whole bunch of video stuff as well. So that's awesome. A big thanks to Winford and Nandalal and Adam and everyone else who's making sure our social media and our media stuff is on point. Awesome. So we're doing a great job at the moment. Really glad to see you all. Let's see how you're all doing. Oh, communion on Friday with John and Emily at 2 o'clock. Absolutely, Amanda. So at 2 o'clock every day on our Facebook account, uh, we have a meeting. 4 o'clock every day we have a meeting for the younger children. Half past 4, there's a Zoom meeting for the older children, secondary school age. So there's stuff for the whole family right now. We don't want anyone to feel locked in and alone during lockdown. And so we've got stuff for the whole family there. So that's awesome. We're just looking over here. Amanda's just typing in all the links here on the public chat. And let's see if there's any chat on the Facebook or YouTube going on. Awesome. Praise God. Lots of hellos. Lots of we're here. So good to see you all here. Lee's on the YouTube again. Thanks, Lee. I really appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. Hope you had a great day. I have had a great day. I've had an absolutely awesome day. I finished church this morning. Absolutely love church this morning. And then had a beautiful lunch that, that my son or daughter made. I can't even remember who made it. And then um, we went upstairs. Actually, I think Amanda made lunch today. I think it was Amanda. Chicken sausages. They were delicious. And then went upstairs, played a few games with the kids, and then rushed down here because I totally lost track of time. Got some YouTube editing done. And now we're ready to talk about George Jeffries. Thank you, tech peeps. Amen. Richard knows as well as I do. Where, we, where would we be without these people who can work these machines? Praise God. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, Let's look at George Jeffries then, shall we? Let's have a little look at George Jeffries, Champions of Faith, George Jeffries. And so let's start by actually having a look at him. I, I, we can now do this kind of stuff. And so let me just uh, share my screen for a second and uh, see if I can't do this. Uh, here we go. Let's start this from the beginning. There we go. There is George Jeffries. That is what the man looks like. Hello, George. Everyone wave at George Jeffries. And um, I want to start off by taking you back in time to uh, 1928, to April 1928. It's Good Friday. Good Friday, 1928, okay? And I want to take you to the Albert Hall. There is the Albert Hall, okay? There's the Albert Hall there. And um, that is in London. It's still standing today, the Royal Albert Hall. You can actually see it on the photo if you look clearly enough and have a good enough resolution on your screen. It's the Royal Albert Hall. And um, King George V is on the throne. He's the grandson of Queen Victoria. And the world is changing. Okay, let me just stop that for a second. You can see my beautiful face. Awesome. Praise God. Awesome. Can you see me again now? There I am. Hallelujah. So. The world is changing in 1928. Lots of change is going on in 1928. Lots of things are changing. And so um, people have cars for the first time. Only wealthy people, but some people have cars for the first time. Most people have radios for the first time. They actually have a radio. So you actually sit in their house. Nobody had TVs back in 1928. They had radios. They could listen to the weather. They could listen to the news. They could even listen to some of the 1920s music, uh, some of the dance hall music and things like that. And um, you could even fly in 1928. You could catch an airplane and you could fly to Paris. Uh, you could fly to Egypt in 1928. And very soon, you'd be even be uh, able to fly to South Africa and fly further afield. World War I was over. And no one had a clue World War II was going to begin. It wasn't an easy time. The 20s started with a big boom, end of World War I, and, uh, you know, the, the, the roaring 20s. Um, you know, I believe that we're in the roaring 20s now, the 2020s, and it's going to be the roar of the Lion of Judah, and we're going to see some great things happen in our generation. But at the end of the 20s and the 1920s, there was a depression. We all know the Great Depression started in the 30s. Well, really now by 1928, it started. It's already started, and uh, it's, it's a really tough time for the UK financially. Some towns in the north, some towns in Wales, were at 60, 70% unemployment. Nobody has a job. Nobody can find work. London was a little bit less, but it was the highest rates of unemployment the city had ever had and has ever had, even in our times. And so it was a tough time uh, in terms of that sort of thing. And uh, you know, the sort of the roaring 20s was over. 20% um, of children died in London before their first birthday in 1928. 20% of children died. And that wasn't sickness and disease so much as just hunger. There just wasn't money. People didn't have money. A lot of men couldn't work even if they wanted to. A lot of men had come back from World War I very badly injured. They couldn't work if they wanted to. There were even men still injured from the Boer War um, previously to that. And so there was still a lot of depression, a lot of sadness, a lot of hunger. 
And, and like I said, London was slightly better off than some of the other places. London was actually growing as a city at the end of the 20s, starting to expand into Essex and Kent, you know, some of the places where some of you guys actually live. They were built in the 1920s. Uh, a lot of people arriving to London from overseas. People like London. People want to live in London from all over the world. A lot of Jews in the late 20s came over to London as uh, Europe, as mainland Europe sort of shifted into anti-Semitism, you know, with Germany and that sort of lurch towards anti-Semitism. So there's a lot of Jews moving to London as well. And so it was a growing, thriving city in that sense. Women got the vote in 1928. They got the vote in 1918, but only women over 30 who owned land. But now 21-year-old women could vote exactly the same as men. There was a quality of voting in the, in the UK for the first time. And um, I want you to come with me to the Albert Hall. So we're going to go to the Albert Hall. So we're going to get on the tube. That's so how we're going to get there. The tube is running. The Metropolitan Line is running in 1928. And um, you're amazed. It's the first time the tube has had doors that open themselves. Up until the mid-20s, you had to open the doors yourself, and now the doors are opening by themselves. I mean, yeah, is it witchcraft? No, it's not. It's compressed air. But it would look like a miracle to most people. They were really amazed at these doors that opened themselves. So you end up at the Albert Hall, and you go inside. And what do you see? Well, let me give you an image of this. This image is just, just remarkable. Okay, if this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. There, look at that. Look at that. That is the Royal Albert Hall in 1928. Okay, that is what it looks like. It is overflowing. The arena is full. That's people in the orchestra pit. Um, the next day, that's, that's this is Good Friday, on the Saturday and the Sunday, they had to empty out the orchestra pit, cancel the orchestra, and just have people standing room only in the orchestra pit. So, I mean, that's just absolutely remarkable, just remarkable. And so that was what was going on. The Albert Hall was absolutely full. There were 12,000 people in that hall on Good Friday, 1928. 12,000 people, only seats 8,000, and they had 12,000 people in there. Everyone is on their feet. Everyone is praising God. Everyone is rejoicing, singing praises. Everyone is just looking to the front of the room. And let me show you what's happening at the front of the room now. Let's get that to you. Okay, here we go. This is the picture we had before, but here's the next image. Or oh, I should be. There we are. Look at that. That is George Jeffries there. And that lady there is called, I've got her name here, Florence Monday. That's Florence Monday. She was the first baptism in 1928 of a thousand people getting baptized. A thousand people got baptized on that day. One thousand people got baptized on Good Friday, 19. 28 1000 people one i mean that's just staggering isn't it now what would happen was you, you could see the line and that line would be as long as you could see of a thousand people um the men are all wearing those white shirts you saw the women are wearing those white robes you saw that's what they all look like they're all dressed the same getting baptized they were shouting they were making noise they were praising god they were waiting their turn they were singing hymns they were waving at the crowds waving at you as you're singing they're praising god and one by one they come down the stairs into this baptismal tank which george jeffries had made specially he had that specially made and the reason he had it specially made was so the water was running. He really felt great baptizing people in running water. He felt like John the Baptist baptizing people in Jordan. And so he had a big deal about running water. Those were hydrangea bushes surrounding the baptistry there. And, um, you know, because he loved the wildlife, he loved the plants. And he had this beautiful thing set up. And he would wear the, the, the black robes. He loved baptizing people in flowing water. And every one of those thousand people shared their testimony. Every single one of them, while in that water, shared their testimony. And Florence Monday's testimony is, is typical of those thousand testimonies. I've got her testimony here. The first person to be baptized in 1928. Her name was Florence Monday. She came from Southampton. She had spent 14 years unable to get out of bed. 14 years unable to get out of bed. Let's just have another look at this image because it's so powerful. Okay, here you go. Let me share that with you. Can you see that all okay? Let me have a look at that. A thousand people. Look, there's the hydrangea bushes there. You can see the water's running there just a little bit if you look carefully. And so that's Florence. Florence was unable to get out of bed for 14 years, okay? And so with that, with that being unable to get out of bed for 14 years, what happened? She had a very nasty fall. 
very bad fall and it had ripped her knee and had damaged her knee so badly she couldn't stand up without being in agony she couldn't put any weight on it she, she couldn't stand up at all she couldn't walk on her own in addition she had tuberculosis and that made the knee worse as well um in addition from birth she had a skin condition and no one can say exactly what it was. There doesn't seem to be any records. But I mean, I had a, a very similar skin condition. I had eczema as a child and growing up. Uh, she had to wrap herself in bandages. I remember having to do that at school and even as a young adult having to do that uh, because her skin was ripped and bleeding so much. And she was in so much pain because of her knee that she couldn't sleep at night. She'd just scream herself to sleep every single night, the pain and agony of her knee. She would scream herself to sleep, not to mention the skin and everything else going on. So the doctors decided the only way they could help this woman was just to cut her leg off. That's what they decided. They're going to cut her whole leg off. So Florence's sister, her sister went to one of George Jeffrey's meetings in Southampton. And in that meeting, a lady was quite common for George Jeffrey's meetings. A lady jumps out of a wheelchair and starts dancing and starts walking around the room. Well, Florence's sister was called Ivy. And Ivy comes back and says, Florence, you have to come and hear this man, George Jeffries. You're going to go to the meeting. And Florence says, I don't want to go outside. She was scared of going outside. She'd become agoraphobic. Uh, she didn't want to be in a room with lots of people. She was also had that kind of thing that a lot of us have experienced. You know, what if I go and don't get healed? What if I get my hopes up and then get them dashed? But the, the sister insisted and took her anyway. And so her mom and her sister wheeled her to the meeting in Southampton in a, and what was called back then an invalid carriage. It's sort of a cross between a, a car you know a horse and cart cart and a wheelchair okay and they put her in this thing this contraption they wheeled her down the street into the meeting jeffrey's preached on how to handle disappointment as a christian and uh florence loved the message she felt like quite a disappointed person disappointed in god and he started to preach on trusting in god as they got to the end of the meeting um, something really started to touch Florence's heart. And then George Jeffries, he loved to end with a hymn. He loved his old Welsh hymns, but his favorite hymn was All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And as they start singing that hymn, she starts to feel the power of God on her. Jeffries gets off the stage and he walks over to her. I mean, there's lots of people in the room, thousands of people in the room. And he said, points to her and he says, how long have you been able to, unable to walk? And she says, 14 years. And she gets all nervous. And she actually says, my knee has tuberculosis. That's what she told him. And so Jeffrey says, do you believe God can heal you? And she said, yes. And he says, good. I'm having a special meeting tomorrow afternoon on healing. And I'm going to teach on healing. I want you to come. Now, that's really powerful. He could have prayed for that night. And there's nothing wrong with praying for people at night. But the more and more I study these guys from the past, the more and more I study these people, I uh, love that from Eunice there, all hail the power of Jesus, amen. And you more and more study these people, that they made you listen to the word. They believe that the power of healing was found in the word. The sower sows the word, and then the harvest comes. You know, you couldn't get all Roberts to pray with you unless you'd been he listened to at least six hours of his teaching. He gave you a little card, and you had to get the card stamped. Until you'd heard six hours of teaching, he wouldn't pray with you. Kenneth Hagin would do six-week conferences and not pray with people until the end of week three, beginning of week four, because he said, you need to get the word. And so Sometimes what happens is we pray for people too quickly. They don't get healed because they don't have the word. They don't have the faith in their heart. And then they get discouraged. And they're always not going to work for me. And then every time you pray for them, you make it worse. So George Jeffries was really wise there. And he said, come back tomorrow. I'm going to teach the word. Well, that next afternoon, there's people there. And George teaches on healing, teaches on healing, teaches on healing. And that's what he does. He really gets into this teaching on healing. I'm just going to just adjust the webcam slightly there. Praise God. And um, so he's teaching on healing, teaching on healing, teaching on healing. and um, he then prays for her after he's taught for several hours on healing. And he says, Lord, reverse these, this disease. That was his prayer. Reverse this disease. He prayed that a lot. Reverse this disease and unlock, unlock these joints. And the power of God just surges through her and her knee starts moving. Now, her legs are splinted together to stop them rattling and stop this leg moving. But the knee starts moving through the splints. Well, Jeffries grabs a bottle of oil, pours it over her head, and she sits up. And the pain is gone. For the first time in 14 years, she's got no pain. Well, she starts to just sob because of the pain relief. She just absolutely sobs and sobs and sobs because there's just no pain anymore. And she gets up and she starts walking around the room. As she walks around the room a first time, a second time, a third time, she starts singing out an old hymn called Jesus Thou Art Everything to Me. And the whole room just joins in singing with Florence, Sister Florence. She slept through the night that night for the first time in years and years and years and years. And she woke up. When she woke up, all traces of her skin disease completely gone. 
absolutely completely gone. She then goes on to become the pastor of the Elam Church in Gosport, and she was still pastoring that church at 79 years old. That's what happened. That was the first person to get baptized. Can you imagine hearing a thousand stories like that, one after the other, after the other, after the other. This meeting lasts for hours. And nobody's like, oh, I've got to get home to my roast chicken. They just sat there and listened and listened and listened and listened. The whole, she, I mean, it was just amazing. Two days later, that was Good Friday, a thousand baptisms. Easter Sunday at Royal Albert Hall at 5 a.m. for a meeting that starts at 11 a.m. The place was packed. There was 10,000 people in the room. The choir was 2,000 people. And they sang with what the newspapers called joyful praise. From 18, from 928, from that year, from that image we saw, to 1939, every single Easter weekend, George Jeffries packed that place. Every year he baptized at least 1,000 people. Some years it was nearly 3,000 people. They had communion for everyone in the room. And they just celebrated Jesus together. That evening service that night, which kind of ran on from the Sunday morning service, saw hundreds of people saved, hundreds of healings. Cancers disappeared in that meeting. And they closed every service with all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let me show you a couple more images I really believe will help you and bless you and so on. So let's go here. Let's go here. Let's see if we've got this right. So this is um, another photo of uh, an Easter Monday meeting. This is in Westminster Hall. So they'd have the Easter Monday meeting. The crowds would be down a bit, but this would be in Westminster Central Hall. And that's it, just packed and packed with people. Um, this is uh, the Royal Albert Hall again. This is from slightly later on in the mid-30s. And just, I mean, look at the communion table. Look at that. I mean, it's just remarkable. Just the idea of, you know, serving communion to that many people. It's just absolutely remarkable. And so here's George on the left, and um, or maybe it's your right. I'm not quite sure. And then there's Stephen on the other side. Stephen was his older brother, okay? And so the Jeffreys brothers were both preachers. Both had very, very powerful healing ministries. And so I'm going to start off with George growing up. I'm going to talk about him and his brother together. And then I will, um, there we go, that's gone there. I will then go on and talk about, um, you know, uh, just Stephen, uh, not Stephen, just George. Okay, we're just going to just George, really, uh, mainly because Stephen's ministry is mainly overseas. And George is the one planting the church in the UK. And that's what I want to inspire your faith for. <laughs> I want to get you believing in church plant in the UK. You know, I said this morning, have faith in your church. Have faith in God that he can build the church, that he can take the church in this nation and plant churches all over this nation, healthy churches, full of the word, full of the spirit, full of the nations, filled with love. I believe it can be done. So who was George Jeffries? Good question. Glad you asked. He was a Welshman. I'll get a cheer from all the Welsh there listening. He was a Welshman. Okay. And um, some of you will know, some of you will know the stories of the Welsh revival, 1904. Welsh revival. And so in 1904, Wales in the middle of this revival, over 100,000 people born again in one year in this tiny little nation. And um, people used to say that George Jeffries was the greatest evangelist since Wesley. And I'm not going to start comparing evangelists, but in numbers, he planted more churches in the UK than anybody since Wesley. And I don't think anyone's beaten those numbers yet. But we're going to have a good shot at it, aren't we? We're going to have a go. OK, his ministry was exceptionally fruitful. And so I want to start to look at why and ask those questions tonight and hopefully they'll help you. Awesome. So Jeffries is born in Wales in the 18, uh, 19th century. And when he's born, there's only one thing for it. If you're born in Wales at that time, you're going to end up working in the coal mine and you're going to die about 40 because you're going to get some lung disease or another. That's that's your life. That's statistically that's your life. And so Thomas Jeffries, that's the dad and his wife, Keziah. They lived in Maysteg in Wales, and uh, Thomas was a collier, basically a miner, and he had 12 children, and he worked hard because he had, he had to, to put food on the table. That's how it had to be done. George was son number seven. He was um, 13 years younger than Stephen, his older brother, and Stephen actually founded the Assemblies of God in the UK. So, I mean, between the two of them, they did a remarkable work for the Pentecostal churches in the UK. And Stephen's a champion in his own right. We could do a whole uh, evening on him. 
Two of the children died. The eldest child was a boy. He died, and his name was George. So years later, when George was born, they actually named him George after his dead big brother, which I find quite macabre, but apparently was quite common in those days. Um, George was born prematurely. Okay, and again, they didn't have access to the medical care we have today. And so he was a very, very weak young man. And his lungs were very weak. He found breathing very difficult. So Keziah knew if we send this boy down the mines, he's just going to die. So she's looking for another job for him. And finally, age 12, that's when boys started work back then in Wales, back in the UK, across the UK. At the age of 12, he got a job working in a shop because she was determined not to let him go down the mines because she knew he would die because his lungs were so weak. So Sunday, they used to, the family, whole family used to go to Silo Church, which was a congregational church. And um, it was in Nantaflakilil. That's a great word, isn't it? And from an early age, George would sit in the church. And he'd tell everyone in the church, even the little boy, I want to be a preacher one day. I'm going to be a preacher one day. I'm going to be a preacher one day. And that's what he started saying. Now, as he got older, he got weaker. George Jeffries got weaker and weaker. His speech was very distorted because his lungs were so weak. And he had some sort of palsy or some sort of stroke down one side of his face. And he struggled to, one side of his face was pretty much paralyzed. And he struggled to move the whole left side of his body. And his speech was so distorted. That unless you knew him really well, unless you were part of his friends or family, you, you couldn't understand what he was saying. So the idea of him being a preacher was pretty much impossible. And that's what upset him. It didn't upset him that he was sick. He didn't care that he was sick. He didn't care he could barely move his body. He didn't care how ill he was. He didn't care he struggled to breathe. He didn't care about his face being paralyzed. But he cared because he thought, I can't preach like this. I can't be a preacher when I'm so sick. And so, you know, that, that's, that's where he was. And I understand that. I remember when I was in my hospital bed and they told me, you're going to be in hospital six months the rest of your life. All I could think of was, well, how am I supposed to go and plant churches then? How am I supposed to go and fulfill my ministry in a hospital bed? That was what I was thinking. And so Jeffrey's got saved in the Welsh Revival. And because of that, because he got saved in these big meetings, lots of praise, lots of worship, the flow of the spirit, that's what he thought church should always look like. And he taught this. I love this about his teaching. He used to say the church needs to do nothing to get a revival. You just believe that God's big. You just believe that God's done it all. And he said, I want the church to know that God can change anyone. Join me in having a big vision. That's what he used to say. Uh, join me in believing for signs and wonders. Now, George was 15 when he got saved. He went to one of Evan Roberts' meetings. He went to hear Evan Roberts preach. That's the same Evan Roberts when we talked about William Seymour, who contacted Frank Bartleman and indirectly William Seymour and encouraged them to believe for revival in California. It's the same guy, Evan Roberts. And Evan's in Wales preaching on the power of the Holy Spirit. And he'd been praying for something to happen in Wales for years. And when Roberts preached, there would be a move of the Spirit, similar to what we saw under Wesley or Mariah Woodworth Etta. People would cry. People would repent. People would pray. The power of God would fill the room and lives would change. And that was called the Welsh Revival. And one of the hallmarks of the Welsh Revival, one of the things that marked it out in such a way was this, the singing. There was singing in the spirit for hours on end. People would just sing for hours and hours, and then people would pray for one another, prophesy over one another, and people would be changed forever in those meetings. The Welsh revival changed the whole world, perhaps more than any other move of God in history. It's remarkable revival, and remarkable things happened. Now, people packed into these Welsh revival meetings. Hundreds of people were getting saved every day. Wales changed. I mean, Wales was not the same. All the pubs closed down. Not, it was alcohol sales dropped over 80% in Wales in one year. The churches were growing Sunday by Sunday. The pit owners were getting piles of tools as everyone got convicted of stealing from work and bringing the tools back. And there's piles of hammers and stuff all outside that people have stolen from the mines and they're bringing back because they've repented and their hearts have changed. And just all these beautiful things were happening. And so this revival spread. Most people say the most powerful meetings in the Welsh Revival were in Maesteg, which is where George and Stephen Jeffries, that was their hometown. And so they got born again in those meetings. George and Stephen both got born again the same night in the same meeting, 13 years apart, but they both got saved in the same meeting. And um, they both got baptized in the Holy Ghost in the same meeting. Both started speaking in tongues in the same meeting. In three of those meetings in Maesteg, in just three nights, in this tiny little village, five thousand people got born again in just three nights i mean it's staggering what happened it is absolutely staggering the numbers and uh, god can do that in our generation god can do that for you and me um, but sadly the sad thing about the welsh revival 
and it really is sad when you look at how it ended and how it was controlled and manipulated out of existence, is that it burned bright, but it burned very short. And within two or three years, by 906, 907, there were no meetings. There were no meetings in Wales like that. There were no revival meetings. There were no salvations. The whole thing just died like that. Boom. Okay. And uh, I could tell you the whole story how, but it's not a pleasant story. And George and Stephen were really unhappy that this thing had died. Like, oh, oh we, we like this revival. We like these big meetings. We like the singing in the spirits. So they started a daily prayer meeting that these things would happen again. So the two of them started praying together that they'd have more of these revival meetings, these big meetings with the singing in the spirit and the miracles. And so th those prayers are about to get answered, I'll tell you. So the Welsh revival is kind of slowing down. At the same time, Azusa Street, 906, 907, Azusa Street's becoming a big thing. And remember, we talked about William Seymour a few weeks ago. 1905, a Norwegian pastor called T.B. Barrett, he was a Norwegian pastor, T.B. Barrett is one of the, my heroes, and he traveled to the U.S. to raise money for his church in Oslo, and he was in the U.S. for a year, and he basically raised nothing, his trip was a failure, and he thought he could raise some money so he could do some preaching in Oslo and do some evangelism in Oslo, and he had no money, he was about to return home, a total failure, barely had the money to come home. And someone said, you need to go to Azusa Street. If you're in America, Pastor, go to Azusa Street. Just, just go for one night and see what's happening. Well, he couldn't travel to Azusa Street. California was too far from where he was in America. But he heard that someone had started a church plant in New York who'd come from Azusa Street. And uh, so he goes to the church plant in New York. He goes to this local church in New York that's Pentecostal. And those things were just totally unheard of in 906 or 905. And he gets baptized in the Holy Ghost, November 905, starts speaking in tongues. So he goes back to Norway, December 1905. And his first sermon to his own people is on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And man, he is opposed. The Norwegians are against him, but he just keeps preaching. He's a bold, bold man. And people come from all over Europe to Norway to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, why is that important? Well, we get to August now, 1907, and I'm joining the dots here because I want you to see how God joined the dots. And I want you to know that God has a strategy, that God loves connecting people. You know, I am so blessed by the connections God has put in my life. And God will always bless you with godly good connections if you start believing for them. There's an Anglican vicar called Alexander Body. Alexander Body. He's an Anglican minister. He has an Anglican church in Sunderland. And he loved the Welsh revival. He loved going to the Welsh revival meetings. He loved those meetings. And he wants to see the Anglican church change. And he wants to see England change for the better. So he goes to Norway to hear T.B. Barrett. He wants to know what's going on. And so he sees what's going on there. And he says, T.B. Barrett's meetings are better than the Welsh revival. That was his quote, not mine. Okay. And so he invites Barrett to come from Norway to England to preach in Sunderland. And so Barrett comes over and preaches. Barrett stays for three months. Body's wife starts speaking in tongues the first week. The next week, Body's daughters are speaking in tongues. Body doesn't start speaking in tongues at all. Alexander Body's not speaking in tongues. His whole family is. His whole church is. News of these crazy Pentecostal meetings in Sunderland is spreading across the whole country. Newspaper reporters are camped outside Body's house. So Body decides to have Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit conferences in his church so people can come from all over the country and hear about this and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, those meetings continued from 1907 to 1914, and they only stopped because of World War I. Now, at those meetings, the Jeffrey brothers go, and they hear about God. And so, oh, just to say as well, just while we're here, um, in 1907, a young Salvation Army preacher called Smith Wigglesworth gets baptized in the Holy Spirit in Alexander Body's church in Sunderland. So, I mean, that's a story for another time, amen. So in 1910, George had heard about a Baptist church in Wales where people are speaking in tongues. And so him and Stephen decide to go to that church, not to get the baptism in the Holy Ghost, but to go and argue, to go and have an argument about it, to go and tell people it's not from God. And basically they want to protest the meeting. That's what these two brothers want to do. They're so on fire for God. They're going to protest the Pentecostals, you know. And like Paul, we're gonna, we, love, we love God so much we're going to attack the Christians. And people do that today. That happens today, amen. So as, as soon as he hears the teaching, George is convinced that Jesus baptized in the Holy Ghost. Stephen brought his son Edward to the meeting. Remember, Stephen's a bit older than George. His son's a young man. Edward goes into the meeting and gets baptized in the Holy Ghost and comes out speaking in tongues. So George accepts that it's true. He's outside the meeting and starts speaking in tongues outside the meeting with his nephew, Edward. Isn't that awesome? And so 
But all George wanted to do was preach the gospel. But his face at this stage was nearly completely paralyzed. His voice was so distorted, very few people could understand what he was saying. And he was getting weaker every day. He could do less, travel less, walk less every day. So Sunday morning, he started having prayer meetings before church on Sunday with his brother Stephen and a few other young men from the church. He turns up early to church and they start praying. And he got healed during the prayer meeting before church. There, there, there's a good hint. Get there early. Well, don't, don't miss the miracles. God might just heal someone at 10.30. And you get at 10.35, you missed it. Okay? And so this is what George says. This is his own words. We got to church early and decided, let's kneel down and pray. While praying for the service of the day, it was 9 a.m. And the power of God came upon me and life and flowed into me. It was amazing. It was like being charged up with electricity. It seemed as if someone had plugged my head into a giant electric battery. My whole body from head to foot was made alive by the spirit of God. And I was completely healed. From that day on, I've never had a symptom of any trouble. And many times since then, the spirit of God has come on me in the same way, making my body alive. And so the church then says to Stephen, the older brother, preach this evening. Why don't you preach this evening? And so Stephen was working the minds all day by day. And then most evenings he was holding preaching meetings in the church. And he was a very, Stephen was a very enthusiastic minister, you know, full of passion. He'd run around the room. He'd call people to repent and people got saved. He was a gifted evangelist. People got saved in large numbers. And Stephen kept asking George to come and preach too. He said, George, you can preach now. You've been healed. You've always wanted to preach. Come and preach, little brother. And George says, no, I need to go to Bible college. God's calling me to the mission field. I know God's called me a missionary. I don't know which country yet, but I know God's called me to the mission field. There's a big mission field where people really need Jesus. And that's where I'm going to go. And so I need to go to Bible college. And so um, at this stage, I don't know if I said this previously, but at this stage, uh, their, their dad had died. Thomas has died. Like I said, lifespan back then for the mine workers was very young. You know, you, you got to 40, early 40s, and you were gone because of just the work in the mines, the lungs, and so on. And so he died. And so um, Kesiah had actually remarried a younger man, uh, George's stepdad, and he agreed to send George to Bible college. So in 1912, George goes to Wales to go to Bible college. Now, he wasn't allowed to study in most Bible colleges in the country. He, he applied, but they wouldn't let him in because he was a tongue talker. And we're not having tongue talkers at Bible college because we can't have that. And so Preston Bible School said he could come for one term, and that was in Wales. So he goes to Wales, and he goes to Preston Bible College for one term. And it's amazing, again, connections. The people he met there became his lifelong friends. William Burton was one of his classmates. If you don't know William Burton, he started the Congo Evangelistic Mission. He was one of the most successful missionaries to Africa of the 20th century. A remarkable, remarkable man. Just his life. Maybe he will do him one Sunday night and talk about his life. And... Um, if you ask the Bible College director, what do you remember George Jeffries? Ask his contemporaries. They said George Jeffries wanted everything to be done biblically. Everything we said, he'd go, where is that in the scriptures? Where is that in the Bible? What does the Bible say? And so the, that's what they remember him for. Where's the scripture? And he met a whole bunch of people who became his lifelong friends. E.J. Phillips was there. Uh, let me tell you a story from William Burton. Just so you know, William Burton um, lost all his teeth. <laughs> he lost all his teeth. He had no teeth. He was absolutely gums. And he prayed when he went out to Africa, and he said, Lord, when I go to Africa, I want to have my teeth. And he grew an extra set of teeth. They, they just grew in. I mean, that's a beautiful, powerful miracle. And uh, he, 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 before the week before he went to Bible college, he was in the butcher's shop. And in the butcher's shop, there was a deaf woman trying to order meat, and it was so complicated because she couldn't understand, couldn't hear. In frustration, he laid hands on her and prayed for her, and she was completely healed of deafness. And um, that broke out in his church and split his church in two. And the church, it was just, that's what happened. And so it was, it was a remarkable thing that was happening. He went to Bible college and he actually came back and started preaching and brought both parts back together. I mean, remarkable man, William Burton. And E.J. Phillips was there. E.J. Phillips went on to lead Elam after George Jeffries had finished leading Elam. And um, so George at Bible college. At the same time, Stephen's now in Swansea and he's preaching, doing evangelistic meetings. And these meetings in Swansea are growing and growing and growing and increasing. And rather than preaching once a day, the people are just turning up and he needs to preach three or four times a day. So he contacts George and says, you've got to come and help me in Swansea. I can't keep up this pace. I can't keep up all this preaching. And so for three or four times a day, they alternated for seven weeks in Swansea. And that's how George started preaching. One lady was healed in her foot. The doctors were going to cut the foot off and she was healed one night. She couldn't walk and they prayed for her and she started walking around the room. People came from all over Wales to hear that testimony, to hear other testimonies, to hear the brothers preach. So in 1913, Body asked these two brothers to come and preach at his Pentecostal conference. 
There's very few Pentecostal preachers in the country, and these two were being successful. So Stephen decides not to go. He just doesn't feel it's right to go, but George does. Every other preacher who's baptized in the Holy Ghost is over 50, and George is there, 24 years old, and he out-preaches all of them. He just impresses them all. So Body says, after this conference is finished, why don't you stay for a few weeks and preach to my people? So while there, while preaching one night at Body's church, he realizes which nation God's called him to, which godless heathen nation God's going to send him to. And it's not the Congo. It's the United Kingdom. And he realizes that God's calling him to be a missionary to the United Kingdom. And so Stephen then starts pastoring a church in Clonecli, and George starts this evangelistic mission called the Revival Band and traveling and preaching the gospel. Very rarely did they ever preach together again. And uh, they never fell out. They just felt they were better doing their own things. And they still got on as brothers their whole lives. And they never fell out. But they part ways. Stephen starts starting evangelistic uh, churches. He starts assemblies of God churches. And George Jeffrey starts healing. So we're going to stick with George from now on, if that's okay. We can do Stephen another time. You can read about him yourself. Okay. And so it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And so George's passion was planting healthy, miracle-working churches in the UK. And so you can understand why I admire that. And I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to go to Elam Bible College. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to go to the Bible College that he started. And that's why I did my training. And so as far as, and because he started that Bible College, because he taught so many pastors, they called him the principal near the end of his life. That's how most people call him the principal. And as far as the UK goes, he was probably the greatest apostle of the last 100 years in the UK. He not only just won loads of people to Christ, but he planted churches all across Great Britain and left them fully established churches, new converts, new ministers, new pastors, and most of those churches are still around today. And I believe it can happen again. I believe we can have a first generational church planting movement in our generation. And so after the success of Sunderland and people, all these other ministers here in this conference, one of the pastors at the conference asked George to come to Ireland to preach. And the past, Ireland loves George Jeffrey's ministry. They love him. So they form a group called Elam Evangelistic Band. Why did they choose the name Elam? It's in the Bible. It's an oasis in the wilderness that, that Moses takes the Israelites through. And it was a place where the children of Israel could get their water. And George Jeffries wanted this to be a place where you could come in the desert of life and get your water and be refreshed and be encouraged to keep going and be encouraged to you know keep fighting and keep standing. And um, so that's what he felt. George's big passion was he said, I want churches where the word and the spirit both flow together. That's what I want. And so they plant a church in Belfast. That's the first church they plant. That's the first real Elam church in Belfast. And George starts pastoring the church. Now, one of the people in the church dies quite soon after Paul uh, George starts pastoring. And he's quite an old man. He dies of old age. But he left a significant amount of finances to the church. And so they set up a charity to now start churches around the UK. And they set up what they call the Revival Party. which is a group of evangelists who go into a town and just keep doing meetings until they can you know, get loads of people saved. At that stage, the, the kind of the, the evangelistic meetings was the priority, not the church planting. It was about big meetings, big healings, and they'd leave, and then everything would kind of go back to normal in that town. It wouldn't change because they didn't understand some principles about planting churches at that stage. That was in 1921. So in 1921, George Jeffries feels he has to go to London and start a church. He doesn't really know how to do it, but he starts that church, and it gets very rapidly up to 500. George didn't want to live in London. He never wanted to live in London when God called him to London. And he, he took a long time to get used to London. He eventually died in London. He spent most of his life living there. But at the time, he just felt that's what God wanted. He liked Ireland. He liked the, the sort of nature of Ireland. But he was now getting invites across the UK to preach. And what he preached was what he called the fourfold gospel or the foursquare gospel. Elam used to be called the Elam foursquare. And America, foursquare is very similar. And the fourfold gospel was this. Jesus Christ is the savior. Jesus Christ is the healer. Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the spirit. And Jesus Christ is the coming king. He's all those things. It was slow going at first. It really was. But eventually started to build a bit of momentum. For a short while, the Assemblies of God did all their church planning in the UK through the Elim Revival Party. And they got them to plant their churches. By the late 20s, they were holding these giant meetings in the Albert Hall. You know, they held 50 of those meetings in 10 years. Over 10,000 people in every meeting. Birmingham, no one had preached the crowds as large as George Jeffries did in Birmingham, not even Wesley. People loved the four square gospel. Donald G., one of the Pentecostal historians, he said George Jeffries was the most gifted preacher in Great Britain by a large margin. And he was a humble man. He kept his eye on the Lord 
and he had remarkable, remarkable meetings. I'm going to tell you about a couple of those meetings, but first of all, I just want to have a look and see how we're doing. Where is the scripture? Amen, Amanda. That was the question. My great grandfather was impacted by the Welsh Revival. Yes, he was. Awesome. Praise God. Good to see the public chat. Good to see the comments. Good to see the amens. Really do appreciate that kind of stuff. Really is wonderful. And so I'm really glad this is helping you. Keep saying the amens. Keep telling me it's blessing you. It really is a blessing to see that's happening for you guys. Okay. So he has a meeting in Portsmouth. And one of the big things about Jeffrey's meeting, it happened loads of times in Jeffrey's ministry. They go to town, hire a little hall, and then I get packed. And then hire a bigger hall, and that get packed. And then hire a bigger hall. And eventually in the biggest hall in the building, Portsmouth, there was no hall big enough to hold all the people. George wrote to his friend, I'm having the time of my life. Souls are flocking to Christ. The healings are marvelous. And yesterday, they turned 100 people away an hour before the meeting even started. In Liverpool, the only place large enough to preach is the boxing stadium. And George gets into the boxing ring and preaches from the boxing ring. I mean, that's just awesome. Now, in, 18, in 18, 1926, wrong preacher, wrong decade, wrong century. In 1926, George Jeffries gets a phone call from Amy Semple McPherson. You may have heard of her. She started Angela's Temple in Los Angeles. Again, another one of these champions of the faith. Amy Selma McPherson was the first person ever to own a Christian radio station and the first person to ever own a Christian TV station. A remarkable woman. And she was not just American, though. She was Californian. She was from L.A. And she was an exceptionally flamboyant preacher. I mean, even by anyone's standard. And George liked her. George was a big fan of what she was doing and the way she ministered and the way she was ministering in America. And so she's in France. She says, I really want to meet you. I've heard of what you're doing. Your big meetings in Albert Hall and so on. I really want to meet you. So George only hired the Albert Hall in 1926 as an accident because Liverpool, the venue in Liverpool cancels. They was going to have these Amy Semple McPherson meetings. So he hires the Albert Hall, and this is the first Easter conference. And the truth is this, and again, it is, I don't want to make any judgments on anyone, but this is the best I can read what's happening from the accounts of the time, is that the 1920s English Christian, your average 1920s uh, Gregorian English Christian, did not know what to do with this Californian 1920s flamboyant, comes to church in an evening dress woman. Uh, they, they, the meetings were not, they were not received well, okay? However, and this is a point I want to make to everyone. She spent some time with George, and she really helped him and say, look, your model's not working. You're having these big evangelistic meetings, and people are getting healed, and people are getting saved, and people's lives are being changed, and that's awesome, George. But to build something cross-generational, you need to stay a bit longer, raise up leaders, invest some of your time in training leaders, and build and plant churches that are healthy with good pastors. And she spent a lot of time teaching him about how she did that. And so when she left, George's focus changed from big evangelistic meetings to church planting. Now, what does that mean? It means that he's now not functioning as an evangelist. He's functioning as an apostle. He's functioning at a whole different level. And he always had that anointing and equipment on his life. It's quite obvious. But he didn't know how to do it until he met someone who was a bit more experienced than him and could speak into his life. And so although the people of England, the people didn't appreciate her ministry, her, what she gave privately to George Jeffries impacted this nation so much that it would not be the same without what she did and came. And she turned what would have just been another series of meetings, a footnote in history, into a church planning movement that is still planting churches today, almost 100 years later. And so that's a really important point. You know, and so sometimes, you know, I might have an American preacher come over and you might think they're a bit too flamboyant or they're a bit too this or they're a bit too that. And I appreciate that. But just appreciate what their impact might be to me. Appreciate how they might be helping me and helping me do what God's called me to do or helping some of the other pastors and leaders in our network and in this nation. Just a thought, just a thought out there. So from that moment on, when she leaves, George starts planting churches aggressively across the UK. He starts, well, we're going to plant churches. If I go and preach in a town, I'm going to plant a church there. I'm not going to go and preach anywhere that I'm not going to go and plant a church. He wanted people to, who had the power of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, to be able to worship in a church that was open to them, that loved them, that knew what was happening, that knew how to steward that, that knew how to love them, that knew how to create the excesses and really be a spiritual church. And so where where tongues would be celebrated was one of the things he said. I want to have people be able to go to a church where they celebrate speaking in tongues. 
And so he changed his approach. And rather than going for a week or two, he started doing eight weeks in a town, 10 weeks in a town, and then appointing a pastor. And then he would rent a building or even sometimes just buy a building outright for that pastor to have a church. So he was going in there and building and planting churches. By 1928, two years after that, Elam had 70 churches in the UK. By 1930, they had 100. And by 1933, they had 150. I tell you what, when I listen to that, I get fired up by those numbers. In 1933, started church number 150 in Aberdeen, 400 salvations in six weeks. That's how you start a new church. The momentum was remarkable. Time after time, they'd hire the hall and they need a bigger hall and a bigger hall. In 1930 in Birmingham, they start off in the Congregational Church, outgrow that, move to the town hall, outgrow that, move to the skating rink, that's 8,000 people, outgrow that. Last four weeks of that crusade, they moved to a venue, the Exhibition Centre, 15,000 people every night for 26 nights. 10,000 salvations in one month. The local paper said, they took our city by storm. And George was bold. He'd just hire a big hall and start meetings. People didn't have a clue who they were, but and, and the local churches hated them. I mean, you could talk about that for hours. They were hated by the denominational churches, just absolutely hated. And it's all about envy and ambition. I know exactly what it's about. And they would start with a hall almost empty, but after a few miracles, people started coming. Liverpool newspaper excerpt, anyone? Let's read from the Liverpool newspaper. Remarkable scenes of religious fervor are being witnessed at the tiny chapel in Windsor Street. Several remarkable cures have been claimed by the sick and maimed people who have been anointed with oil during the campaign. Several of the patients, whom the pastor described as being under God's power, have swooned and lay trembling for several moments. Some of the healings that have already taken place include a five-year-old girl suffering from paralysis, a woman healed of deafness, a man from heart disease, and two from paralysis. Same newspaper, next day. Hundreds of people had to be turned away from yesterday's services. Queues began to assemble outside the chapel two hours before the meeting commenced. As soon as the doors were opened, crowds began to clamor to get in, choking the aisles in every inch of space. A crowd just as large could not gain admission and had to remain outside. While a few yards along the street, other evangelists were preaching in the open air to the overflow crowds, long until after 10 o'clock at night. So great was the pressure inside that the pastor could not move and could not anoint anyone with oil, and the service had to end early. Nevertheless, despite this, several people testified to healing, including a woman who had been dumb for many years and two women healed of deafness. That's the local newspaper. That's what people are reading in their papers. Man, back when you could read the media. Elam's own newspaper. Elam publishes own newspaper, his own meetings. One woman said, 19... Y y nah. 19 long years of suffering was healed from paralysis. But when anointed by Pastor Jeffrey, she was completely healed. Another lady related after four years of suffering from hip disease, and during which time she'd had no less than four serious operations and laid in iron chains for three years. Her case was pronounced as hopeless by the doctors. God stepped in and marvelously delivered her. And now she can do her own housework. Absolutely wonderful. All women should get healed so they can do their own housework. Amen? Awesome. One of the cases that excited most interest was a young man whose condition was pitiful in the extreme, paralyzed in every limb and unable to speak intelligibly. He was a helpless child. What a change raw in him. I remember so well the evening when full of new life, he swung his arms above his head and then with exuberance of joy, jumped again and again, demonstrating the reality of his healing. And um, there was eyewitness accounts of uh, Exeter in 1932, Southwest England. One of the things I'm in that meeting was uh, George Jeffries prayed for a man and the uh, onlookers heard his bones crack into place as he was healed. People 30 foot away heard the cracks of this man's bones crack into place. Probably the most remarkable healing I can find in Jeffrey's ministry was a young girl who was born without eyes. And George prayed for her several nights in a row. And he prayed one night, Lord Jesus, give this little girl her eyes right now. I say prayed. Give this little girl her eyes right now. Amos Pike was one of the guys standing right next to that girl. And he said, suddenly the girl was looking at us with her eyes. And I've never seen eyes such a beautiful shade of blue. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that awesome? Isn't God glorious? Isn't he wonderful? Let's see if I've got a few more images to show you. And um, I probably do. Let's have a look. There's George and Stephen there. Okay. 
And there's Reinhard Bonke. Why are we showing Reinhard Bonke? Well, I'll explain that at the end. And uh, that will really bless you to understand why that's happening. Awesome. Praise God. And so this is the Birmingham newspaper, 1931. This is uh, Birmingham newspaper, for some reason, was recording what happened in Plymouth. Even skeptical policemen who were on duty to regulate the throng have been swept off their feet by what they've seen and heard. One night, two girls, one blind and the other dumb and mute, inquired of the officer nearby their way to the service. An hour or so later, he was amazed when the couple returned to him, dancing for joy, the dumb girl was speaking and the blind girl was seeing. Now, George was not married, just so you know that, he wasn't married. He felt they needed to spend all his time sharing the gospel. In fact, every Elam evangelist in George Jeffrey's lifetime was unmarried. If they got married as an evangelist, he would then find a church for them and their wife to pastor. He didn't believe that, that married men should be on the mission field evangelizing. In fact, what's quite hilarious, I mean, George Jeffries died in 1962, but um, immediately after he dies, all the evangelists in Elam get married. All of his revival party get married in about a year of him passing away. Quite, quite true. Um, so, I mean, I, I personally, just talking from my own history, I know people who were there in Birmingham. I met people. Um, I had the absolute joy when I was at Bible college to preach at the Elam. Elam had its own um, old folks home. I don't know if it still has today. It was in Liverpool. And I would go and preach every Sunday. And I'd sit down. And that was mainly the ladies in that old folks home uh, were mainly the wives of uh, the first generation of Elam pastors. Some of them were in those big meetings in the Albert Hall. Some of them were in those Birmingham meetings. Um, you know, when I was in Dundee, Elam with Amanda, that's where me and Amanda got married. That's where Adam was dedicated in the Elam Church in Dundee. Um, there were ladies there in the 90s that they saw 800 people singing and praising God in Dundee. They, they saw blind eyes open in Dundee when George Jeffries came to town. In 1930, George Jeffries packed out Crystal Palace. He packed that out every year until it was burnt down in 36. If you want some more information from Jeffries, uh, there's a couple of really good books about him, but he wrote two books. One was called Pentecostal Rays and one was called Healing Rays. Healing Rays is a remarkable book. It's really hard to get hold of. And it's such a shame that he's not been reprinted. His meetings in the UK were bigger than Smith Wigglesworth. He saw more healings than Smith Wigglesworth. He planted more church than Smith Wigglesworth. But for some reason, it's hard to get hold of his materials. But his book, Healing Rays, it tells us healing is part of the curse. Adam brought sickness into the world and Christ took it out again. And we can all be healed right now because Christ has beaten death once and for all it's an amazing book i recommend it to anyone who's interested in healing not just because of his bible teaching on healing but he really goes into the early church he's done a lot of research and he goes into the stories of miracles from the first second and third generation of christians that you can't read in many places you can't get hold of and it's not a perfect book he has a bit of information that God gets annoyed at you so much, he'll put sickness on you to get you. I mean, that's just not true. We know that's not true. But the heart of the book is excellent. He actually goes right back to Martin Luther, John Wesley, and some of those guys as well, and shows how they believed in healing. He's got some remarkable healing testimonies from the life of Martin Luther and John Wesley in that book. And in fact, it's the only place I've ever read, and I believe it's right because his research was meticulous, that John Je George there, John Wesley, we talked about last week, John Wesley was actually healed of tuberculosis. He prayed for himself and he was healed of tuberculosis. And it's a great book about healing in church history. So Healing Raised by George Jeffries. Absolutely recommend it. And people really hated George Jeffries on that healing line. And he'd just say, look, it's the age of miracles. Come and watch. He wouldn't argue with anyone. Just say, come and watch. Come and see. And uh, he actually said to one group of ministers, he said, I don't preach healing. I don't preach healing. I preach Jesus. But he is the healer. I don't preach healing. I preach Jesus. But he is the healer. That's a beautiful line. And then it's, it's difficult to know where to, to take this. George Jeffries gets ill and he's ill for a few weeks and he's in bed for a few weeks. And what we do know is that God spoke to him while he's in bed. And what God said to him was set your house in order. That's what God said to him. Set your house in order. And he felt that meant two things. Number one, he felt that Elam had got too much into debt and he had to start getting it out of debt, get the Elam churches out of debt. And the second thing is he felt that Elam as a denomination, the central board was too controlling. They were telling pastors what they had to preach. They were telling pastors exactly how to run the church, what to wear. And they'd become a very controlling, top heavy institute. And he wanted the pastors to have a lot more freedom and a lot more authority in their own churches. And so he wanted to change those two things. Well, that caused a lot of problem across the board at Elam. And uh, George Jeffries had actually set up Elam, so he didn't have all the power. He only had 40% of the power. The board had 60% of the power. And rather than continue to bring strife, 
George Jeffries resigned from Elam in 1939. He felt that he couldn't bring the house in order. He really felt that couldn't happen. And so there's a real dispute as to why he resigned. And it's difficult to get into it because lots of people are writing from an agenda. People have got an agenda, especially when someone's got a legacy of churches that are all over the nation. And what some people are saying is that Jeffries resigned because he embraced this very bizarre idea. And it is a bizarre idea. There are people who embrace it today. There are people. It's called British Israelism. Some of you may have heard that. And basically what British Israelism teaches is that the British people, the people born in England, the people born in Great Britain, so the Anglo-Saxons, are the lost 10 tribes of Israel. Now, there's no historical evidence for that. There's no... There's, there's no genealogical evidence in that. There's no DNA evidence. There's nothing matters. Nothing matches that theory. But some people have that theory, and it's British Israelism is what the name of the theory is. And it does seem that later on, near the end of his life, Jeffries taught that once or twice. It does seem to be evidence that he taught that. But this did not seem to be a big issue at that time. In fact, I've read a Q&A that Jeffries did slightly after in the middle of World War II, and he said, why is this an issue, British Israelism? The issue is the gospel. He said, I don't care if a pastor believes with the Jews or not. The issue is, are you preaching the gospel? Are we preaching the gospel? And so it got quite messy. And some very childish letters were penned, some from Elim and some from George Jeffries. I've read some of them. They're murky. I'm not going to repeat them. They're, they're childish. And it's probably not helpful to dig into it. I wouldn't go and spend time digging into it if I was you. I don't think it's helpful. But I would say this to everyone listening to me. We all carry the treasure of God in earthly, earthly vessels. And we're all capable of making big mistakes, no matter how glorious and how fruitful our ministries. And never forget that. Never lose that humility and that grace that you need other people. Because when George Jeffries quit Elam, it ended an era. It ended a lot of things for a lot of people. Elam becomes stagnant. According to their own researchers, Elam did not change between 1940 and 1970. It just didn't grow. It just didn't grow. Same number of churches, same number of people. It just was absolutely stagnant. Secondly, uh, George Jeffries never had the same number of people in the UK again. His ministry never reached the heights that he built it up to over the years with Elim. Now, some pastors left with George. All the evangelists left with George. The evangelists wanted to go with George. And George's ministry became much more of an international ministry at that stage. I'm not convinced that's how it should have happened. I, I don't know enough to judge. But he did have some very successful meetings in America, in Canada, in Belgium, in Sweden, in Norway, in Switzerland, in France, in Palestine, as it was then. He preached at big conferences, but he never saw those kind of Albert Hall-sized crowds again. But he served God faithfully until 1962 when he died. He even planted several new churches called the Bible Pattern Churches. 25 ministers left in 1940 to join George. And so that's out of 161, just to give you an idea of scale. But by the end, the Bible Pattern Churches were only five churches. In 1970, they rejoined Elam and said, we, we don't want to be what we are. His split with Elam, if you read most of the accounts of his life, a lot of them major on that split. And I don't think that's fair. I think we need to major on the fact that he was a remarkable church planter. He was an exceptional evangelist. He was a healing ministry on par with Smith Wigglesworth. The evangelicals loved him as well. They did. Martin Lloyd-Jones, some of you may have heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He would go and sit in George Jeffrey's meetings regularly and listen to Jeffrey's preach. His greatest success after he left Elam really was on the international field. He packed out Paris, a thousand salvations in one night in Paris. In Nice, he preached the casino, standing on top of a blackjack table. Switzerland was noted for the healings. I could list them. Sweden, Norway, lots of healings. So it's now January 1962, we're at the end of Jeffrey's life. He preaches in London with healings, with miracles, and an altar call. And at the end, he starts singing a hymn from the Welsh Revival in Welsh. 1962 in London, he's preaching, and he preaches in Welsh. He starts singing in Welsh. The next Tuesday, Monday, he rested. Tuesday, he went and visited every convert who got saved in that meeting. There were dozens. And he prayed for the sick in the house who traveled all day Tuesday. Wednesday to Friday, he went street witnessing on the streets of London, inviting people to church. And then Saturday, he went to be with Jesus. That's how he lived. That's how he died. He was 72 years old. Five weeks earlier, he had made friend. He had made peace with E.J. Phillips. E.J. Phillips was running Elam when George resigned. And the, the real feud was the two of them. They'd gone to Bible college together. They were very close. And again, I don't want to dig into it too deeply. But five weeks before he died, 
um, that, that they made peace and they reconciled, which I think is beautiful. And again, I think that needs to be made on more than, than what it is. His funeral had over a thousand people from the UK. People came from all over Europe to be part of his funeral. His ministry was really well respected in Europe. I'll give you one last story before we finish up. One last story before we wrap up. And uh, Ian there's actually given us a link. You can actually get the PDF file of um, uh, Jeffrey's book there. And um, that's excellent. Preach Jesus, he's the healer. Amen. Uh, Amanda said the same thing on the, the online church as well. Jesus Christ is the healer. And so praise God. And uh, Paul Vasily saying much better reception on YouTube. Uh, we've done a lot this week to make sure we've got the reception. I've got a new webcam. I've plugged in an Ethernet cable to my modem to this computer. Uh, we've changed providers. We're doing all we can to make sure that these meetings are as enjoyable as possible for you. Um, I know some of you are fanatics. You'd sit here and watch that little spinny circle for hours just to get a couple of words of the word of God. But we want to make sure that we're getting the truth out there in the most convenient way possible. But let me close with this story because I really believe it will bless you. 1961, December. So we're about six weeks before George Jeffries died. Okay, about six weeks before he dies. And, uh, you know, you already saw that picture of Reinhard Bonnke. Let's just show that picture again, shall we? Oh, how do we do this? Come on, Ben, you're better than this. There we go. Uh, from the beginning. Oh, these are just amazing pictures, aren't they? Aren't they just awesome? Look at that. That's just beautiful. George and Stephen there. Man, you can see their brothers, can't you? Even very different faces. But man, there's Reinhard Bonnke. Okay. There's Reinhard Bonnke. Why have I shown you a picture of Reinhard? Why is that important? Well, at the age of 19, that's not me. I don't want to put that label up there. Let's put, get the app up there. At the age of 19, Reinhard Monkey had just finished his first term at Bible College. He also went to Bible College in Wales. And um, he was returning home to Germany for Christmas. And so he gets the bus from Wales to London. And the next morning, he's going to get the bus from London to Germany. So he's walking the streets of London, really not knowing what to do with himself. And um, he travels from Wales to London. He's walking around, waiting for this next leg of his journey. And he notices a sign outside a house that says Jeffries. And he thinks, could that possibly be George Jeffries? That man that I've been taught about that went to my Bible college and planned all these churches. Could I be outside George Jeffries' house? So he knocks on the door. And a 19-year-old Reinhard Bonnke, a skinny little German, says, can I please see Mr. Jeffries? Is this Mr. Jeffries' house? And the housekeeper says, George Jeffries does not take visitors. And she's about to shoo him out of the house. <laughs> She gets married as soon as George Jeffries dies as well as all the evangelists. It's, it's bizarre. But Mr. Jeffries comes down the stairs and he says, come in. I've been expecting you. And so the young man, Reinhardt, says, I'd never been in the presence of an apostle before like this. I just sat opposite him and thought, I need to evangelize the world and plant churches. And George Jeffries said to him, you need to evangelize the world and plant churches. And he starts prophesying over Reinhard Bonnke that you are going to evangelize the world with great power and you're going to change the world. In the last half of the 20th century, you'd be hard pressed to find an evangelist who's seen more people saved than Reinhard Bonnke, a million people in one night. And one of the last things George Jeffries did was lay hands on Reinhard Bonnke and prophesy over him and tell him that. Just remarkable, remarkable life, a remarkable flow of the spirit, remarkable miracles. Prayed for a girl with her eyes and watched the eyes grow back. And again, I'm telling you all these stories, not so we can go, wow, what a wonderful man. I can't wait to get to heaven to meet him. And, you know, it's going to be great to meet him when we get to heaven. I'm telling you these stories because Romans, Romans, Revelation 12 and verse 10 says we overcome by the word of our testimony. We overcome by those words. We overcome by these things. And so why am I telling you this? Because I want you to realize that God is bigger than we're thinking right now. God can do bigger than we're thinking right now. And God can do more than we can imagine. And the reason I've shared Wesley last week and Jeffries this week, I want you to know is that God can save the UK through English people in England. We don't need the Americans to come over. I love the Americans. I love American preachers. Some of my best friends are American preachers. But this is our nation, and we can bring revival to this nation.
and we can bring the gospel into this nation and we can go into all of this nation and preach the good news we can preach that four square gospel jesus christ is the savior and he'll save anyone to the uttermost no matter how bad you've lived jesus christ is the healer he is the baptized in the holy spirit and he is the coming king and it's closer to his coming at least a hundred years closer than it was when jeffrey's preached it and so i just want you to be stirred up today I just want you to be on fire for these things and i really pray that these things and uh, let me just put that image back on again because i mean it's just amazing just absolutely amazing there's reinhard but i'm thinking more going backwards uh, from the beginning this one this one here this look at this look at that look at that can you see that okay is that okay i don't think that's working hold on let's try that yeah there it is there you go look at that why can't that happen today why can't we have churches like that today why can't we have eyes grow back today why can't we have lives change today why can't we have these things happen today we need to start believing big we need to start expecting big things to happen in our nation we need to start expecting lives to be changed we need to start expecting good things to happen amen well everyone's saying dream big thank you lord all that kind of stuff really blessed so it's happening and what, what i wanted to achieve this evening i've achieved next week i'm going to continue this champions of the faith and we're going to look at the life of a man called ew kenyon one of the greatest bible teachers of all time and uh, we're going to look at his life and times and how he lived and how he died absolutely remarkable life and we're going to have a great time so what we do is just want to keep it open for a few more seconds if you've got a prayer request I would love to pray with you right now. I'd love to believe with you right now. I'd love to stand with you and see things change. I'd love to see things change. I'd love to see your life change. I'd love to see your finances change. I'd love to see your health change. I'd love to see your walk with God change. So if you need prayer, just ask. Type it in the online. I've got the online there. I've got links to YouTube and Facebook. Um, so if you want to type it in, then no problems. Type it in and I will pray with you and believe with you. Hallelujah eyes and limbs growing back yes please lord jesus that's what amanda writes amen amanda absolutely praise god we've seen bones grow back we've seen things like that happen to a limited degree we even saw our own son's kidney grow back adam um was diagnosed only having one kidney in the womb and uh, we got a whole living church to pray over him that was an elam church george jeffrey Stide church and we prayed over him and that was in 96 when Amanda was pregnant with Adam. And we prayed. And the next week, went back to the scans. And he had both kidneys. God grew a kidney back in the middle of the womb. And God can grow limbs back and grow kidneys back and grow things back. Praise God. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm not getting any prayer requests here. That's okay by me. And so hold on. There's one from Brian. He pray for Chris's sister. She's having an operation tomorrow to remove a growth. We just curse that growth in Jesus' name. We dissolve it at the roots. And Lord, we pray that that healing would glorify you and your name and Chris's family in a very special way. Amen. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor from the Welshies. Come on, Tracy. Amen. You know, God can do and change the world through Welsh people. Amen. My cousin, friend's little girl to have normal function in her lower limbs. Father, we pray for Laura's cousin's friend's little girl to have normal function in her limbs. Legs, in the name of Jesus, work properly. Just come alive right now. Start to skip and dance and jump in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Pray for Huda. Her husband, Nigel, passed away today. If I pronounce that right, Chris and Vaughn, is it Huda? Um, I pray for Huda right now. Lord, you're the God of all comfort. And I pray you would comfort her right now. You'd let her see in a fresh way how much you love her, the depth of that love, the height of that love, the, the breadth and the length of that love, that you would give her wisdom and strength day by day to walk through her grief and her pain, to do the practical stuff that needs to be done, but also just to know your goodness in a new and fresh way. In Jesus' name, praise God. Please pray for Jack. He's got a bullet lodged in his brain after the burglary in Upminster. Well, I pray for Jack right now, Lord, that that bullet would just dislodge from his brain and just fall out in a supernatural way, that he'd be free from that bullet in the brain and his brain would function normally. In fact, I pray he'd be smarter than he's ever been in jesus name hallelujah hallelujah let's start dreaming big thank you ashley and anna sue look at that these messages are really helping us to dream big 
Amen. Uh, Fortunately, I want to pray for everyone in the tree of life. I promise, short side, long side, ligaments, nerves, and eyes, cell regeneration. Father, I pray, like Moses, that we in the better covenant than Moses would have eyes that can see with 2020 vision, eyes that do not grow dim as we age, eyes that do not grow weak, that we'd be able to read the smallest of texts, see the things at a distance we need to see, that our eyes would be healthy, that we'd be famous in this nation for being a church of healthy eyed people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. In fact, if you're in the room right now with someone with glasses on, who's got short-sighted, long-sighted, eye pain, eye problems, anything, if you're in the same room as them right now, lay hands on them right now and start commanding those eyes to be 20-20 vision, to be clear, to be crystal clear in Jesus' name. Start doing it right now. Come on. Don't, don't wait. Just do it. Just do it. Don't ask them permission. Tell them I said it's okay. They're listening to me preach. They'll, they'll be okay with it. It'll be fine. Hallelujah. I should call my mama son de la day. He can't tell a little boy so bad. Can't none you no more son de la day. A little boy calls a taka no more son de la day. Oh la 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 little boy son de la day. God, I thank you that you have not forgotten how to make eyes. And I just command every eye that is being. And anyone watching this right now, anyone who's being laid hands on right now, I command every eye to function perfectly. 2020 vision, strong, clear, without pain, without any dysfunction, without any lack of sight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody's being healed right at the front of the head. There's a real pain right there. They're being healed. Somebody's got gut ache. It's been even you want to run away in the middle of listening to this, but you didn't want to leave. You didn't want to hear them. You know, you want to hear the whole thing. You're being healed right now in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Somebody's in an upper back pain. It's a lack of mobility and a pain. You're being healed right now in Jesus name. Somebody's right kneecap. that hasn't functioned properly for a couple of years. You're being healed right now. Receive your healing right now in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody here, you spoke in tongues seven years ago. You haven't spoken in tongues for seven years. And there's been all sorts of things in your mind. Why no? You have the gift of tongues. And right now, you start speaking in faith. You're going to start speaking in tongues again right now. Stop speaking in English. Just start speaking in tongues. That's God opening your mouth. God is loosing your tongue in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Man, if you're getting healed right now, type in the testimony. I want to know it. Hallelujah. I want to hear some stories of healings in Jesus' name. Amen. Rich and Jackie, you're asking the same thing. Let's get some testimonies written down right now. Hallelujah. Healings is happening. The glory of God is here. Hallelujah. Oh, show no more koto leleda. Oh, leleda drabo sundere de. Jesus Christ. I don't preach healing. I preach Jesus, but he is the healer. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just give you some notices quickly, and then I'll see if we've got any more prayer requests or testimonies. If we haven't, then we'll wrap it up. And so those of you at the beginning, you got these. You can hear them again. Those of you who missed them, Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Sorry, there we go. Chris and Vaughn on their Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash chrisandvaughn.lachlan. Facebook.com slash Chris and Vaughn dot Lachlan. 7 p.m. We get to worship with Chris and Vaughn. 8 p.m. We have a Zoom meeting with Lawson Purdue. Lawson is a pastor. He spent a lot of time with Lester Sumner. You could do a whole movie, a uh, whole movie, a whole sermon with Lester Sumner. He was a, a champion of faith. My goodness, he was a special man. And uh, maybe we'll ask Lawson to tell us some Lester Sumner stories. But he's going to talk and inspire us to have faith and believe in faith. It's going to be an awesome, awesome Tuesday night. Wednesday night, we have Richard Waller. Um, on Facebook, facebook.com slash I love the tree. And uh, Richard's going to be talking about imagination and how we think. And that's so important. You need to listen to that. 8 p.m. Lee is going to be on um, Facebook doing a healing meeting every day next week, two, Monday through to Friday. We have prayer at two o'clock. Uh, communion at two o'clock on the Friday, every day at four o'clock. Me and Lydia, we're doing the storybook, going through the life of Nehemiah, aimed at the primary school age children. Half past four, Lee does a Zoom meeting for the secondary school age children. If you want to be in on that, email Lee or email me if you don't know Lee's email. We'll get you in on that. And so we've got a lot of stuff for you because we want to feed you. Like I said this morning, you know, green grass. We want to prepare a feast for you in the presence of your enemies. Amen. Let's see how we're doing right here. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Please join me in prayer. My sister's house sale will be finalized this week and for financial prosperity. Let's just pray right now for Laura's house, sister's house sale. Lord, we pray this house sale will go through. And despite the market being down, that this house sale will be up. And it will be an amazing testimony of your prosperity and your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, come and join Chris and Vaughn. That's on Tuesday at 7. Room for everyone in their front room. And who knows who will join them? It could be the bear in the big blue house. It could be Bob Marley. It could be a giant paper sun or moon or love heart. Or it could be anything. It could be all four of the Teletubbies. I don't know. I don't know. Though I have heard that the Teletubbies on lockdown have now become telly obese. I need to go on a telly diet. Um, so praise God. It is an action-packed week, Richard. Absolutely. And I'm really glad it's blessed you. And uh, I'm just seeing if there's anything on the online church, any prayer requests. There's nothing I can see. Praise God. So we've done it. We've prayed for everyone. We've blessed everyone. It's an action-packed week next week. Join Chris and Vaughn on Tuesday in their front room. It's going to be absolutely awesome. It really is. And um, this meeting will be on YouTube very soon. Uh, if you've watched it live on YouTube, you better watch it again almost immediately afterwards. Praise God. God's a good God. He really is awesome. He loves you. He cares for you. And Jesus Christ is the Savior, the healer, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and the soon coming King. Amen. So I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Praise God. Bye-bye.